for a long time in my earlier days when I didn't understand relationship stuff, I was sort of a recovering friend zone guy, if you will. So I would have all these female friends who would tell me what, you know, jerks and bums these men were that they're dating. They weren't interested in dating me at that time because I didn't really understand what I needed to understand. So I had to do my work as well. But I actually started to believe it, you know, right? So I didn't realize that men actually can be heroes. They weren't all like jerks and dogs who were just out to take advantage of people. Uh, and and so you can imagine the, the bit of discomfort. I'm a man, right? And so here I'm starting to buy into the fact that, you know, men are these, you know, misbehaving uh, dogs that need to be watched constantly. But it's only when you don't really understand how they work effectively and how the, how you get the best out of them, how you connect, how you communicate, how you share, how you hold boundaries, how you make a needs request, ask for what you want, actually know your value. Uh, so there are a lot of ways to communicate with men so that you can get what you want. And it's really powerful. Yes, I agree with you. And I think this is something that we can all gain value in learning more about, not only in our romantic relationships, but in all of our interactions uh, with people, you know, men and women, whether we're in the professional workplace or wherever we may be, uh, to learn some of these tools and techniques that you're going to share with us are so valuable in all aspects of our relationships. So since we are talking mainly, though, to women that are single or wanting a relationship or wanting to improve a relationship they're in, Dave, can you share with us some examples of some of the ways that women can bring out the best in men instead of settling for the worst, like some tangible takeaways we can start using right now? Sure. Well, so I think the most... Uh powerful thing that a woman can do in interacting with a man is she needs to do her own work first and that's to know get to a place where she knows her value and she understands who she is and what she brings to the table because from that place it's like if you think about it as a negotiation if you know your value and you know the situation and you you're really clear on it you're going to be so much more effective in asking for what you want and getting it and and people will want to say oh Okay, got it. Okay, she knows her value. This is one I'm not going to be able to do that with. And and uh, men will respect that and they will appreciate that because women who maybe one of the main tools for keeping a man in line in the past before they've done this personal development work that you and I teach is a process of emasculation. It, it's about, you know, getting in someone's face, you know, being, uh, you know, argumentative, being angry or yelling and that kind of thing. And look, we all know that doesn't bring out the best in anyone. It doesn't work with your kids. It doesn't work with your man. Uh, nobody wants to be yelled at. They don't respond to that. But when you do that work and you know your value and you ask for what you want and you put it out there and, you know, occasionally you may need to hold a boundary or something like that. Uh, when you treat a man like you actually respect him and you appreciate him, and you believe that he is not just this misbehaving, hairy woman who needs to be reined in all the time. He's actually a man who's worthy of your respect and admiration, and he actually can be a hero. Like, that's a game-changing mindset shift. Or, you know, rather than someone who needs to be constantly told what to do and corrected, you're actually looking and interacting with him in a way where he can actually be your hero. And he gets it, he feels it, and, you know, it's, it's a total game changer when you, again, like I was listening to those uh, friends of mine, female friends of mine, early on when they would tell me how oh, these men treated them badly, and I started to buy into it too, like, yeah, that's terrible. But then when I realized, wow, there really is this heroic side of the masculine. It's the hunter. It's the, you know, men since the beginning of time would die for a cause bigger than them. And they, that's really admirable. And if you treat a man with respect and, and admiration and you, you know, treat him with dignity, uh, you might be the cause that he would be willing to die for. And I think that's a game changer of a way uh, just to communicate with people and having that respect. And it, it's reciprocated too. So it's a totally mutual thing. I think it's just a beautiful place for two people to uh, co-create what it is they want. Uh, they're literally, they're creating with their beliefs 
they're creating the relationship they believe they can have. So again, if you, if you believe someone needs to constantly be corrected or someone's always going to take advantage of you or, you know, they quit and they go away and they disappear. And, and so you don't want to be open or vulnerable and you put up these walls, you know, the truth of the matter is, you know, a lot of my clients think that, you know, like men leave or something, but it's like, well, they haven't seen the best of you because you're, you've got these walls up or you don't know your value. Uh, so the work starts with the ladies a lot of times, but when I'm working with them, because they're the clients that I work with the most, um, it, it starts with them, but it's just really a mindset shift. And then it's about some communication strategies and beliefs and just mm-hmm. a way of dealing with people. Yeah, I think we can really create a win-win scenario by doing what you're talking about. And right. I think what you're touching on is so profound, Dave, because I do believe when a woman knows her own value and is centered in that, she can feel more comfortable or confident in expressing her wants and needs. She can do it perhaps in a way where it is a request or an invitation rather than something that sounds like a command or, or like he's doing it all wrong. And then that allows a man to respond in a way where he feels like he's responding in choice. And then the next step that you were alluding to here is if a man is rewarded by being appreciated, then he gets to feel good about having done something, provided something, or filled a need for the woman that he's with that allows him to enjoy feeling like he is her hero. And so we create this win-win scenario, right? Right, exactly. And I love that you mentioned that too. I'm, one of the other people who I learned a lot from was Stephen Covey in his Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And as you probably know, win-win or no deal is one of his seven standards and how you, you get along with people. And it, it, the, just the knowledge and awareness and the standard that, you know, this is going to be a win-win. And I'm not interested in anything other than that. So why don't we just figure out what that looks like? What is it that you need to feel good? What is it that he needs to feel good? And let's just figure out a way that we both get our needs met. I think that's, there's no other way to deal with people effectively. Um, And so I think it's just really strong and, you know, just asking for what you want and creating an invitation, you know, rather than, uh, than an obligation and making your, in a celebration too like that's it's just so much of a better place to come from and in interacting with another human being mm-hmm. yeah one of the things that I like to teach my clients and share with them is also perhaps based in one of Stephen R. Covey's other uh, principles which is seek first to understand and then to be understood I love that one as well well they're all fabulous right yeah absolutely there's only seven they're great yeah but I really like that one and I and to and to expand upon that one of the things I like to to teach my clients is to at least not always assume that a man is coming from a bad place or the wrong place or a hurtful place right right Um, give him the benefit of the doubt until you understand something more deeply. Uh, Here's, you know, something my husband will say to me sometimes, Dave, you'll probably get a kick out of this. He'll say, now, if I've said something and it can be interpreted in two ways, and one of those (laughs) ways hurt your feelings, I meant the way that didn't hurt your feelings. I meant it in a good way, right? He is a wise man. Yes, that's great. And, you know, I find if I... If I find that something he says maybe triggers me a little bit, if I come from that place and and take time to catch my breath and and look for a little deeper understanding about right. where he's coming from, then more often than not, by far, I find out that he is coming from a positive and a loving place, right? right. And it's really the assumption that gets you off, you know, down that road that you probably neither of you want to go down that the assumption that someone's misbehaving or someone has done something or intentionally did something because then it, it gets down to a belief about that. And underneath of that belief, that's where the fear lies. Uh, so it's really under, it's important to understand what what's beneath that. Like you, you can look at it two different ways of like, like, has been so brilliantly brilliantly said. Um, when you when you make an assumption about what the intent was, 
there's only one way to go. But if you give someone the benefit of the doubt and you just inquire like, well, I'm not sure what you meant by that. So when you say that, I'm thinking this, can you walk me through your thought process on that? And so in that question, there is not an accusation like, how dare you talk to me like that? That's an accusation and there's only one way to go. And now you've got two people who are kind of doing one of these things. Uh, you're sort of knocking foreheads and it's all of a sudden it's a, it's a, a disagreement and someone has to be right and someone has to be wrong. Uh, but if you ask the question and you just elicit answers like, walk me through your thought there. Tell me what you meant by that. What is it that you're really looking for? What would that look like if you had, all, you know, what would it look like if you had everything you wanted here? And it's a great way to come to really a negotiation. If you just get to that place of understanding that it's really about partnership is what we're looking for. Like, you know, you understand like, absolutely, my partner needs to have their needs met in exactly the way they want it. And what can I do to facilitate that? Like, that's a huge place where you're already making that leap and say, you know what, my partner's needs are a little bit different from mine. She comes from a different place. Um, your man needs different things. He processes the world differently. He has different beliefs, awarenesses, strategies. But when you come together and you're not making one another wrong, you sort of enter one another's worlds a little bit. And, and education is the best way to do that when you start to understand. It's like no one is here trying to disrespect uh, the other. We're just all trying to get our needs met. And that's fair enough. So the question is, how do we now do that most effectively so that we come away with that win-win that we were talking about? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I often think about this, for example, with married women who are upset because their husband forgot their anniversary, for example. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so, but my husband and I have talked about this and, and I said, you know, that's never going to happen because we're going to be having a conversation early on in the month of our anniversary talking about what we're going to do and what we're going to plan. In other words, I'm not going to lie in wait and see if he happens to remember or if he happens to bring it up, I'm going to say, hey, honey, guess what? It's our anniversary this month. What are we going to do to celebrate? <laughs> that's pretty smart. I mean, yeah. that's you're being proactive rather than reactive. Because if you look at that whole scenario, like what underneath of that belief of like, I can't believe this jerk forgot our anniversary is I'm not very special or he doesn't appreciate me or he doesn't value me. If you look at the hurt underneath of it, now you understand. Uh, and, and your way of handling it is, like I said, is proactive. You want to set him up to win. But if you have a fear or an insecurity and you feel like you are not, you know, top of mind and important to your partner, You'll sort of sit there and lie in wait and just look to catch him and like, see, I knew it. I knew it. I'm not important to you. And now you've gone and proved it. But if you, it, the, the issue is that you believed it right. first. Right. And that's what got you down to that place that's probably difficult to come back from. Because okay. then if you believe you're not very special, you're, now you're going to have to go look for evidence to support that belief. Right. Even if last year he remembered and bought you like a really beautiful gift. But if you went right back to that belief that I'm not really special and he's like, well, wait a minute, I did remember. I have remembered. And so he's constantly feeling like he's not enough. And then he's looking like, well, she's not very appreciative. And now you've got two people who are looking for evidence to support the worst beliefs about one another. And it's not a great place to be. Yeah, so this comes back to what you were talking about at the beginning of the conversation when you were giving the example of some of your female friends who were reporting in on all the bad behavior that they yeah. were seeing and experiencing with men when probably a lot of what they were experiencing had a root in what their basic belief system about men was in the right. first place. So then we, as human beings, develop confirmation bias. We start with a belief that may be false to begin with, but we go out and we gather evidence, not necessarily meaning to, but we gather evidence to support and strengthen that belief to the point that it's almost impossible to see evidence to the contrary, right? Absolutely. And it, it's really problematic. And that's why, you know, I'm sure you're the same. You, we start, we go within with our clients and we build them up. So they actually start to believe that, you know what, 
I am a pretty great partner and I do bring some really good and valuable things to the table here. And you know, when she knows her value, then she's going to interact with him in a way where she, because she knows her value, she will accept a lot less poor behavior. She will ask for what she wants. Uh, she won't assume the worst. You know, she just shows up differently because she knows her value and she's not like on edge waiting for the next example of why she's not important. You know, it's just, it's a totally different way of interacting and it, it creates that beautiful partnership where it's two people on the same page. You know, how do I meet your needs? How do I meet your needs? Well, let's figure it out. Let's put it together. And, you know, you just understand uh, from the beginning, you know, with the begin again, back to Stephen Covey again, begin with the end in mind. Mm -hmm. you know, my partner deserves to be absolutely loved and adored and cherished and just the way she wants it. So how do I figure that? Now, some days I do better than others. I, have, <laughs> totally I, make, well. <laughs> I make mistakes as well, as she knows. <laughs> but it, it, she's, she gives me grace on that. And she knows that I'm, as your husband says as well, you know, if I mess up, I really didn't mean to. And sometimes it, intent is the biggest thing in the world. You know, if you say, well, you know what? I can see how you would feel that way. It certainly wasn't my intent. Like, yeah. That's a huge beginning right there when you say I wasn't, wasn't the intent um or i just overlooked it or you know my bad you know my my wife says one of the things i'm actually quite proud of it like if she sort of gives me some feedback you know, mention something that i haven't done as well as i would, probably would have liked to have done uh i will sit back and i'll be like yeah you're right i probably did fall a little short there i'm sorry let me fix that or my bad let me let me take care of that um, and most of the time I do, but you know, again, by the same token, if you're if you start with this thing and you're you're pointing in someone's chest and telling them how you always or you never, what are they going to do with that? Because now it's a battle over who's right, and you know, that's never a good place for two people because one's going to win, one's going to lose, and over time you both lose if you start that po poking that finger and and you know, making demands and accusations. And again, it all starts with the belief that someone's misbehaving or treating you in a way that they, you shouldn't be treated. Right. And uh, we're most likely in those scenarios making assumptions right. about what their motives might be or what might be going on with them that we really don't know. I mean, uh, just, you know, an hour or so ago, I had just dropped a huge glass of grape juice all over the carpet in my house. Mm. The phone rang and I answered the phone like, hello? <laughs> it probably didn't sound very friendly. But I was like in the middle of like a huge mess, freaked out, and whoever was on the phone might have thought I was rude. But it had absolutely nothing to do with them. And so that's another thing to remember. We don't, you know, we don't know in a given moment what's going on with another person. And so yeah. when you talked about your wife giving you some grace, I think in dating situations and relationships, allowing the grace for us to find out a little bit more about what's going on before we react is so incredibly powerful. Right. And, and to your point, too, the grape juice incident uh, that you're mentioning, uh, if, if you uh, are, are that person on the other end of the line and you feel like, you know, well, you don't you're, you're not very valuable or they'll actually start to think that they did something to engender that response. And they again, when you have a belief, you got to go look for evidence to support that belief. So they will go and find evidence of why they're annoying or why they're bothered people when it had absolutely nothing to do with them. They had no idea what was going on in your house with, with the grape juice, but they will find a reason like, ah, I do that all the time. Mm. I annoy people or I make people angry. What's wrong with me? Like that's the worst question in the world. You know, as soon as you ask a question like what's wrong with me, your brain goes right to work saying, well, let me tell you, uh, here's a list. Do, 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 do. And, and you'll answer the, whatever question your brain asks, either good, bad, or indifferent. So if you say, well, what do I love about me? Then your brain will go to work and it'll give you 20, 50, 100 answers. But if you say, well, why do I always do that? It's like, well, you always do it because you're this, 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 this. It'll answer whatever question you put to it. And too often the, the quality of our questions is not very good at all. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, I think another area we can make assumptions in that gets us in trouble is assuming the other person knows what we want or knows our preferences or knows what we like. And, you know, this is almost like a running joke that women kind of, in many cases, expect a man to be able to read their minds. <laughs> right. Of course, I've, I've definitely learned in 10 plus years of marriage that that's not true. <laughs> But there are ways that we can make requests and and bring attention to our needs in ways that a man can hear and respond to and feel like he's in choice and then be rewarded for that by our appreciation. And we're much more likely to get our needs met and for him to feel good about himself and what he's providing in the relationship, thus creating that win-win scenario. Right. And understanding, too, uh, when you ask for something, understand that the masculine and feminine have very different interests uh, in, in how they navigate the world. You know, it's about masculine is typically about logic and analytics and what's the best way to do this? What's the shortest way? And it's about economy of effort. They don't want to waste time, waste effort. And I'm big on this. Oh, yeah. Way. That's you a know? good one. Yeah, we don't want to do it. Let's do this smart. I only, my wife, we were doing a renovation. She asked me to move this uh, big sheet of uh, drywall to another location. I said, why would I do that? We haven't painted that. Let's paint that first. Why would I do it twice? And that was probably the wrong answer at that moment. <laughs> but Because it, it wasn't, wasn't a logical analytical request. It was an emotional request. Like, no, I want it moved. She had a reason meant something to her it was an emote it comes from emotion but the feminine navigates from emotion she it's just we're on a different playing field and when you kind of understand that like you can sort of again you understand that people are looking for different things and they have different values beliefs standards ideals um but again you just you give grace you're like right okay sure i'll move it <laughs> right right yes this efficiency and that you're talking about here in the easiest or the most logical, straightforward way to do things, I think is very strong in many men. I know my husband, and I may have given this example before, but we'll come home from the grocery store or something, and he will load up like a pack mule before he'll take two trips out to the car. I mean, it just cracks me up because he'll just be grunting and groaning and loaded down, and I'm thinking, there was probably an easier way to do that, just... Back and forth. We're talking from the garage, but in his mind, that's not efficient. That's just, you know, he'll load up 20 sacks if he has to and, and load up like a pack mule to get it in. in and he'll feel like a hero because he did it all in one trip. Right. Like that's the bonus benefit. And it's like, I didn't waste any time. I was totally uh, on top of my game and efficient. And now I'm ready to move on to the next thing. And he's forgotten about it. But yeah, it's really, it's hardwired into us. And, you know, we can kind of sit here and talk about it and laugh about it. You know, now it's not that irritating habit that he always does, or she always says this, you know, it's like, oh, right, this is an efficiency thing, or this is a process thing. Or like the other example is, you know, like, um, you know, from the man's perspective is say, look, you can ask me to do it but you can't dictate process on how I do it. And that's sort of an understanding. Like, you know what, you, you either tell me how to do it and, and that's not going to go well. Cause again, we want to have that autonomy and like, we know how to go and fix it. Uh, but, but those are two areas where you get, in, you know, you step on toes a little bit. If you just, if you don't give someone the autonomy to figure out what's the best way to get that job done, let me know what are the parameters, you know, what does it look like when it's finished and when do you want it finished? And, you know, I'll do it when I get to it. Like, after this play or after the game or, or tomorrow or by Thursday, whatever it is, give us the parameters. Let us have, let us do it our way. And then again, we both believe that we have, you know, the ability to make these decisions and no one feels taken advantage of. You're not like pulling someone away from what they're doing at the absolute worst time, you know? So it's, it's just an understanding of how we work together most effectively. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's really, really important. I know, with my husband, I have had to learn that he loads the dishwasher differently than I do. I mean, I know that sounds really, really dumb, but I think every woman out there has their idea of how the dishwasher should ideally 
be loaded. And probably two women couldn't even agree exactly on that. And when my husband puts the dishes in the dishwasher, they're kind of ski wampus going every which way. And, I, you know, he doesn't load them as strategically as I think he should because, you know, I think more could fit in there than he ever gets in there. And at first I thought, oh, they're not going to get clean. And I just, I have to let this go because he said to me exactly what you just said, Dave. He said, you can ask me what to do or tell me how, what to do, but you can't tell me how to do it. Right. <laughs> you can't tell me how to do it. Really? So, so I walk away. I, you know, I go in peace and I trust that those dishes are going to get clean and they do, but it's weird how I have to like, remember that so that I'm not hoovering over him um, think, telling him more or less that he's doing it wrong. <laughs> right. Well, and they, that's a great indication of everyone, their behavior and um, what they do is a direct reflection of their most important values. So for instance, he's usually very much efficiency, but in loading the dishwasher, it's not so much efficiency of order, it's efficiency of time. Like right. get him in there, get it done, get him done. Get right. out of here. I wanted something else. So it, it's interesting when you start to understand how all these values sort of interconnect and are different, whereas you have more of an efficiency of order, he becomes more efficiency of time. And right. so, oh, all right, okay. So we, when you start to see it, and again, it's interesting. No one's misbehaving. We just have a different value. What's the most important job here? You know, and is, is either one right or wrong? Not necessarily, as long as the doggone dishes get clean and, <laughs> right. and the washer and they're ready to go for the next meal. So, Right, right. So what, uh, what other tips do you have for women that are in the dating process as far as how they might express some of their needs, wants, or preferences to men? I know we've been talking about this broadly, but I'd love if we can talk about maybe a few specific examples or ideas around that. Sure. Um, well, the assignment that I give to my clients on the first date, especially like, you, know, you might as well get right out of the gate, start doing it correct, well, not correctly, but, you know, in, in a way that sets you up to win. Because again, we're going for that win-win. Um, what I do is the, the assignment I give is your job is to go and listen to them, ask open-ended questions. And, and the, the thought that's in your mind is, what do I like about this man? What do I respect about him? What do I appreciate about him? What do I acknowledge? What do I notice about him? And then I ask you, reflect it back to him. And so if you're on this date and you're meeting one another for the first time and he's, and he's talking about how he started his business, you know, 10 years ago, and you might admire that. You're like, wow, you know what? I really respect someone who, you know, doesn't necessarily, you know, go with the traditional, you know, working for one company their entire life. And they go, you know, they have a, a they you admire the entrepreneurial spirit, someone who can go and build something or, you know, is there talking about what's important to them and maybe, you know, they have multiple degrees and you, you have a high value on education and you really respect that. Or maybe they, maybe they didn't have multiple degrees, but they immediately, you know, got out of school and began working and building their own thing, whatever it is, look for something that you respect, admire and appreciate. And if you reflect back five things, most of the time on a first date, a lot of the anxiety comes from, oh my gosh, does he like me? Or, or And sometimes men are doing this too. Like, oh, I shouldn't have said that. Oh, why, why did I say that? Oh, I should have said this. Or is he, is he going to call back? That's the, the, you know, the one they're always looking at. Like, I don't know how it went. I'm not sure. I think it went good. I'm not sure it went good. He hasn't called yet. You know, I just, I left two hours ago. Why haven't I heard from him? Why didn't he text? Why didn't he ask me out for next week? You know, there's that, you know, monkey mind thing that's going on and it, mm -hmm. it drags you down and it makes you not show up as this confident, amazing woman where a man's meeting you at your best. And your job on that first date by reflecting back those five great things that you like, admire, respect, appreciate, uh, your goal is to just leave him better than you found him. Mm -hmm. And that's beautiful and elegant and simple and it's great dating karma. So even if this is a guy that you maybe don't want to see again, or it's like, well, I don't necessarily think I have enough information, but I certainly like to see him again uh, to, to figure out more about him. Or it's like it's the first night of the rest of your lives. It, it's good dating karma, and that sets you up, you know, as you meet more people. You know, and, and they might have, you might have this date with a person, and he's like, you know what? I don't really see a match here, but you know what? My best friend, Josh, you guys 
should really meet. I had one of my clients who uh, has actually become a dating coach. I met her when she was doing this um, 35 dates in 35 days. And we've done some work together with, um, with interviews and stuff. And she didn't meet her husband on that. But date number 34 was someone who introduced uh, her to him to the guy she ended up marrying after that. So you just never know. It just puts you in a great place and, and look for the best in people and you'll find it. A lot of people who have been hurt or wounded and have some, you know, little things that need to be healed before they can show up whole and healthy for a relationship. Like they're going to look for what's wrong or, you know, they're sitting there at that date, like with their arms folded. And if you look for what's wrong, you'll find it. It looks for what's great. You'll find it. So, set both of you up to win by just looking for what's great. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're getting married, uh, but it might too. So. Mm. Oh, I love that concept, Dave, when uh, that you just shared, I think that's so incredibly beautiful and powerful. Leave him better than you found him because I believe if we could show up in all of our human interactions and add value to whoever we're interacting with, with a little bit of kindness or with a little bit of appreciation, yeah. whether or not, yeah, whether or not they're going to be our love for life or not, uh, what a what a happier time it would be for everyone out there dating and interacting with people. And that monkey brain chatter that you were talking about, if that's going wild, which it so often does. Um, it's, you're, you're not showing up in that way. You're not showing up with that kind of energy or that kind of presence. And I agree with you. I think that's very elegant, a very lovely uh, approach to a first date. So thank you so much for sharing that really. Yeah. stuff. And I, and I think you can even inspire other people when they show up and they're just like, wow, that was a really nice date. Again, it might not be the, your forever love, but it, it's really just a beautiful way of, you know, meeting people where they are and allowing them to go out and feel good. I mean, I'm sure we've all had that terrible date or, or whatever. And, it, you know, it's like a spiral. Once it starts to spiral down, it just, you know, it gets bad. And I've had clients that tell me, like, you know, they go in and they look across the room, they see that person sitting there and like, oh, he doesn't look like picture or this is going to go bad and one of my clients said just the other day oh my god what am I going to do for the next 59 minutes and I was like oh my gosh I can't imagine a first date you know going in with you if you if you're saying that your brain's going to say I don't know what are you going to do what are you going to do you know because it's just terrible and it's just two people who are just feeling bad and you're both going to leave that feeling worse rather than feeling better, even if it's just like, well, I really respect someone who does that, or that's really admirable, or that's fantastic. I, you, you do charity work? That's amazing. I love to do this. And you're just looking for what you have in common. You know, and there's basically in, in life, we have matchers and mismatchers, people who are looking for what's great, and people who are looking for what's wrong. And look, if you're someone who shows up on a date, and you're looking for what's wrong, don't look much further. I think we've got why it's not going well for you because it's always available. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and we all in this, in this field of work that we are blessed to do, Dave, we all have so many cases of people that upon a, that initial meeting didn't feel that immediate connection or that immediate chemistry. They weren't their type exactly or whatever, but it, eventually evolved into being a really deep beautiful connection and in some cases even soulmate love right <laughs> right and you never know someone might have had a grape juice incident just before the date <laughs> that's right that's right and so then they make up a story like oh gosh this is the third bad date this month whatever and it's off to the races and you start to construct that whole terrible belief and then the next one next one next one it, it kind of spirals downhill once it starts so if but if you if you show up with grace elegance uh and you're confident the one thing both men and women agree on the way we want we want very different things men are typically more visually stimulated uh women are, need to feel safe so those are very very different um categories but the one thing we both find incredibly attractive is confidence and Confidence looks like, you know, when you're comfortable in your skin and you know who you are and you know what you bring to the table. So it's a great way to show up on a date. And you're 
both could, if you do what I'm talking about, where you reflect back five things, you both leave that date feeling better than when you showed up just because you did that great thing or that nice thing. And, you know, kindness begets kindness. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a really beautiful concept. So just to review some of our really key points that have come forward here. Mm -hmm. First is to start in that place where you're centered in your own intrinsic value. And this is not about uh, this, the sense I'm getting from what we're talking about here, Dave, is not, this, not that we're arrogant or that we're better than everyone else or conceited, but that you're, you're confident and you're clear that you have value as a human being, in this case as a woman, that you have something to offer and bring to the table. So that's one of the first things that you brought out, right? Yes. Yeah, it's embracing your humanity. You, you, you're not looking to be like, you know, the most talented, fit, perfect, beautiful, every, all those things. You, you don't need to be. You don't, you're just embracing your humanity and getting to meet this person, you know, and sort of seeing what's great in them. And it's, it's just a great place. It, you know, the, was it the fragrance never leaves the hand and the person that gave the rose or something like that? It's just this beautiful um, connection between two people. Mm -hmm. so, Nice and elegant. Yeah, so then a second piece that I think was really important that we brought forward in this conversation was to start from a place, maybe we call it a clear slate, maybe we call it a place of assuming the innocence of the other person. Absolutely. <laughs> and like you use the words that Allison so often uses, uh, not assume that people are misbehaving and give them the benefit of the doubt. One little example of this is, I was talking to one of my clients last night, she had met up with a man for a first date, and she liked him okay, wasn't you know that sure whether she really wanted to see him again, but he said to her, you know, it's the 21st century, so you can call me, meaning that he was basically opening the door for her to call him after the date. And she said, I'm, she said, maybe I'm more traditional, but she said, that's not really what I'm comfortable with. And so she was asking me how she should respond or how she should have responded or could have responded. And I said, well, I said, so let's put ourselves in his shoes for a moment. You know, maybe that is something that he's kind of used to with other people. There are a lot of women that do call men. Uh, maybe he thinks that would make you feel more comfortable or more safe if you were the one doing the calling and he was trying to ease up a little pressure. Um, maybe he thinks you're going to not respond positively to his call. Maybe he doesn't know, so he's just you know, putting that back in your court. I mean, we can, we can just guess on what might be there. But I said, let's just start from a place of innocence that he meant that in a nice way, not in a way that was um, in any way offensive. And so you could just say something like, well, that's so sweet. You know, I'm just a little bit more comfortable, especially in the early stages if you called me. Very nice. So yeah, my, my guess in that particular. That's so nice, or that's so sweet, right? Right, exactly. Uh, and because, again, the belief underneath of that is he wants to make sure that you feel empowered, that you have the, you know, you're encouraged to call him anytime you want as well. My thought is he might have also not wanted to take the responsibility of having been in trouble before because he did call at a time when someone when he didn't read the person's mind about when they were available and when they wanted to call. So, mm -hmm. you know, not exactly incredibly proactive in some ways. So I can understand why you could look at it both ways. But again, if you give someone the benefit of the doubt and you come back and say, like you did, you know, thank you. That's so sweet. But I really love it when my man takes charge too. Mm -hmm. And now you put it back and he's like, Oh, okay. Game on. Now he, he knows what you like and, and, You've given him, you've given him like this blank slate where you you put it back to him, and so now you both have the opportunity to call, and he also knows what would really please you. So mm -hmm. again, you continue to set people up to achieve and to win and be successful, and it just you know people will usually take that opportunity. Yeah, I love that idea. We talked about the win-win um, as we're kind of recapping here, and I think. If we go for a sports analogy, I know you're a sports guy, Dave, so um, 
I know I can talk sports with you. Uh, I sometimes think of it as, you know, like the woman is the, um, is the guard and she's setting the forward up for a successful bucket, a successful, you know, dunk into the basket, right? Yeah, it's an assist. Yeah, it's an assist. And we can assist them. And, and sometimes when we say this sort of thing to women, they're like, well, why do we have to do all the work? Well, you're not doing all the work. You're creating a win-win scenario. The right. gospel is just as valuable, even though the forward was the one that got the shot. And you create a situation where you get your wants and needs and preferences met, and a man gets to have the satisfaction of knowing he's, he's become your hero, he's won, he's succeeded. Uh, he's been appreciated. And then, like you talked about, he will move heaven and earth for you in many cases because it makes him feel so great. Absolutely. <laughs> they keep track of assists, too, so those stats matter as well. Oh, yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> that's a very good mm -hmm. point. So, Dave, this has been a really fun conversation. I love talking about this, and I feel like you and I could, uh, you know, chat about this uh, much longer, but uh, I want to give you a chance to leave us with just kind of a parting thought or last piece of, of wisdom. It really is at the end of the day, it's about partnership. It's about, you know, assuming the best in people and, and you know, when you assume the best, uh, you create the space for that to happen. And again, you just give that grace that no one's misbehaving, you know, they're just doing the best they can with what they have in the moment. Uh, but when two people come to a relationship in that way, you know, it, it's really, like you said, with the assist, it's like you're both setting one another up to win. And I mean, isn't that really what you both want? I mean, life is too short to, you know, be constantly bickering and, and unhappy or not getting your needs met. I mean, by all means, you should definitely find someone who, who just gets you. I mean, really, that's the beauty of the partnership and the relationship. It's, no one's going to be perfect all the time. No one expects you to be perfect. Uh, but it's just a great trait, a great way to show up with, with that grace and elegance and set people, set each other up to win. Thank you, Dave, so much for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you. Really appreciate it so much. Always a pleasure. Thanks. And thank you to each of you for joining us. Bye-bye for now.